Okay, so let's get started. Welcome everybody. Um, just a couple housekeeping items for folks on Zoom um, for our meeting notes purposes. If you wouldn't mind putting your name and contact information in the chat, that would be really helpful. Um, we do have a short presentation. I will share my screen here in just a moment. Um, and I do encourage folks to uh, use the um, reactions feature, the hand raise feature in Zoom if you do have questions. Um, and lastly, depending on how long the meeting goes, uh, we do have a couple of folks in the room who have taken the Pine Street bus to get here and we'll probably hear comments from those folks uh, first to make sure that they are able to get out to the Pine Street bus um, before it leaves at 640. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Is everybody able to see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so I just included this. We did have one meeting last night. Today is the second public meeting to discuss some permanent service changes. Um, and we do have a third meeting tomorrow from three o'clock to six o'clock PM at our Montpelier Transit Center. Um, for any folks who are link riders who uh, want to stop by, we will. We have been gathering data for the last week and a half on proposed um, or preferred link schedules. So any folks who filled out that survey, uh, we will be posting recording in progress a schedule. Uh, tomorrow and we'll have a copy of it with us at the Montpelier Transit Center. Okay, so um, I've included a little timeline here. Uh, this kind of gives a picture of where GMT has been for the last couple of years. Um, COVID has brought a lot of things to a lot of people and what it sort of did for GMT was mask some of the uh, financial issues that we were having prior to the pandemic. So the timeline starts back in February, 2020. Um, at that time, the GMT Board of Commissioners approved uh, the staff going out to a public process for service modifications on the one Williston, the two Essex Junction, the six Shelburne Road and the seven North Avenue. And what that was, uh, was a change to 30 minute service in the midday. Um, and then March, 2020 happened. And we all know that everything kind of went haywire and GMT put some COVID related service suspensions in place at that time. In April of 2020, uh, we had gone through the public hearing process for the service changes that we brought to the board in February and the board of commissioners approved those per permanent service modifications at the, that time. Um, June 2020, those service changes went into effect. So that was, again, the 30 minute midday service on the four core routes. Um, February 2021, we had been operating that service uh, for six or so months, and we were beginning to have college students returning to Burlington, and we were experiencing heavy overcrowding issues, capacity issues on the one. Williston and the Essex Junction routes. So at that time, we implemented 20 minute, re implemented 20 minute service in the midday on the one and the two. And we kept 30 minute service operating in the midday on the six and the seven. And then we operated that schedule in June 2021. We removed the color coding of our service routes, which, um, if anybody was familiar with our next gen plan, those had gone into place about a year prior. August 2021, uh, we took we brought back the suspended commuter and link runs. So we had suspended a fair amount of commuter and link service um, in March of 2020. So we brought that back in August of 2021. And then flash forward to this March, March 7th, uh, we put some temporary COVID related service changes into place. That was about the time that the Omicron variant was starting to uh, become rampant in our area, and we were 
we don't have uh, the flexibility with our staffing to move drivers from route to route. And so we had made some temporary changes to allow us to have more reserved driver shifts. And that way, if we were seeing high absences due to COVID, we could shift drivers um, to certain areas of the service and have reliable service um, throughout the day and not miss large gaps. And uh, at that time, we also proposed um, a temporary schedule 30 minute peak service on the six Shelburne and seven North Ave. So our peak service time is 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And so this 30 minute service all day. Um, so before we talk about the goal, um, I just wanna bring you down to the bottom of this slide, which is it is past January, the GMT Board of Commissioners did approve our FY23 budget, assuming the resumption of fares and with a decrease in service hours of 4.6%. And so that's what we've been working toward um, this goal uh, as we approach our new fiscal year, which starts July 1. And so the goal of the service changes is really to balance the current and future demand of our service um, and to you know, be able to provide reliable service that's meeting our operational and our financial constraints. I included this slide, um, GMT is a business. We're not uh, exempt from some of the same pressures that other folks are experiencing with our budget, in including our fuel prices, which have gone up uh, considerably in the last few weeks. And they, we have a $4 per gallon uh, price tag right now that was not budgeted in our current fiscal year budget. Uh, we've seen a wage increase of about two and a half percent, an insurance increase of six percent. And since the beginning, since March 2020, we haven't um, been collecting a fare from passengers. And so we are, based on our current riderships, receiving about $600,000 less uh, fare revenue than we were pre-pandemic. Um, we do also have an ADA program that has rising costs every year um, that fluctuates community to community, but that service um, does continue to grow in cost. And the, the real issue that we have right now is a lack of non-federal match. Um, GMT does have federal, uh, federal funds that, we, that are available to us, but we need a 50% non-federal match to be able to draw those funds down. And so it's this lack in non-federal match um, that's really affecting our budget at this time. And then workforce development challenges, um, skilled mechanics and CDL drivers um, have been a problematic area uh, for us to recruit. With threats, there are definitely opportunities as well. Um, high, high gas prices are a benefit to transit ridership. It definitely increases transit, rider, transit demand. Uh, there are several microtransit projects being explored in the state. This is a, a new type of transportation in our state that allows some sort of on-demand flexible options instead of the traditional fixed route service. Um, and it really helps with a first mile, last mile solution. So folks who don't live immediately on the fixed route um, have more options with this type of service. The state climate action plan definitely brings increased awareness um, of climate impacts of transportation um, and increases transit demand. Uh, and it also potentially has some funding opportunities um, for tra public transportation. The Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act um, provides an increase in federal funding, including funding for uh, fleet electrification. Um, so those are you know, exciting opportunities. It's exciting that that money is available. So that's a future opportunity for us. Um, and then it allows GMT the opportunity to really explore some private and public partnerships. So working with uh, local businesses to try to increase some of that non-federal funding that we were talking about, which would allow us to draw down uh, more federal dollars. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the number six Shelburne and the seven North Avenue routes, two of our local routes in March, uh, on March 7th, we did put a temporary service uh, plan in place, which went moved to 30 minute headways in the AM and the PM peak periods. And so what we've been exploring is, you know, what will this 
just due to the service overall. And it does increase the number of boardings per run, which is more efficient service. Um, and decreases the number of vehicles needed for peak service, which eliminates some of the pressures um, on our maintenance staff and on the fleet. Uh, we took a look at our busiest ridership period um, in 2021, which was August through October. And we just looked at what the, uh, the ridership per run looked like on 20 minute service and then projected um, ridership or load capacity um, if we had moved to 30 minute service. So as you can see from the proposed numbers, they're not ridership projections, but we were just simply trying to see if moving to 30 minute service would cause capacity issues on board our vehicle. And from this analysis, you can see um, that it, it really wouldn't. And so I'll, I'll sit there for a second. The next section of the presentation is about uh, the Montpelier Link Express. So I'm happy to, I'm sure there are lots of questions about our local service. So I'm just gonna pause a moment um, and open it up for, for questions at this point um, on the Shelburne and the North Avenue. I work on Home Ave. I live on Riverside Ave. It takes me an hour to get home in the morning if I take the Shelburne. I've been walking up and taking the time to do, which I should not feel compelled to do. I get to work 40 minutes early. And you're going to decrease it at night. I work nights. I don't have to put my job in decrease at night. I mean, is this this nighttime service you're talking about getting rid of you? Uh, we're not talking about removing any more service than we're operating today. Um, we're just talking about making the changes that went into effect in March permanent moving yeah. forward. No, no. I have better things to do than wait around that bus station and go say from my phone like a drug addict for 25 minutes to drink. I'm tired. I want to go home. No. So is the current schedule not working very well, it sounds I like? Mean, I'm killing myself walking those up to go up to Pine Street because I'm not doing the show work. Right. I, I'm not. I, I'm not doing that. I mean, it should take me an hour to get there. I mean, come on. We, we do understand the frustration, and I, I guess I should have prefaced this by saying, you know, before we get to service, uh, reductions. We do explore every other option budgetarily. Um, we have made lots of internal changes to make our organization a, as lean as we possibly can at this point. Um, and so this isn't our first option. We certainly don't look to service reductions. Uh, we know that this is uh, hard for folks and, you know, we're, we're sensitive to that. Um, and you know we're we're trying to find every other avenue, but this is unfortunately um, the point that we've gotten to budgetarily. Where you know there isn't really another place for us to look. Are you taking questions from people online now as well? Yes. Yeah, I have a question about. I see in um, the thing you sent out, six daily supplemental trips continue to operate on school days. Um, I know there's. There's neighborhood buses that go around. Those take the students, but they don't really take adults. What, what would those be, the six daily supplemental trips? What times would those be? Um, so there are supplements. I didn't bring a bus mapping guide down with me. On the North Avenue, we have, Chris, can you? Yes. So what are the times? There's a 6.50. There's a 6.50. There's a um, 7.10 and 8.10 in the morning. And then in the afternoon, um, it leaves the downtown transit center at 2.50, 3.10, and 3.20. And these trips are on the in the published schedule. Um, and I do I do want to clar clarify one thing that you mentioned. Um, the trips that do operate in and around the neighborhoods um, for for the academic school year are open to the general public, and they are available for folks to take as well. Even though they just stop at the schools, you could take those and get off at random stops. You can take them, and a lot of them do go into the downtown transit center area. And those bus, those trips are actually in the back of our bus mapping guide as well. So if there is one that meets your needs that goes to where you're going, um, you are those are open to the general public. Yeah, so, so it, I'm just making that clear. So a neighborhood bus that's rolling through, and I know that the neighborhood bus, I work at a school, if I know the neighborhood bus is going to go to the school that I'm working at, so I can, the bus will pick me up, even though that I'm not a student. Yes, 
Yep. Okay. Uh, I just want to make that clear. Give me their two. Okay. Have their Sure. I can't first. see who they okay. are. First. Dale's first. Okay. Um, Dale. Thank you. You know, I just wanted to um, uh, bounce off the comment that was made by the uh, person who's there speaking live. You know, I know that last night's meeting was at the Miller Center in the New North End, and I took a look at what it would take for me to get there by bus from my home in the South End. And I would have had to leave home at 4.30 in order to get to that six o'clock meeting. And um, if I stayed from six to seven, I would have gotten home at 820. So it basically would have meant that I had to spend four hours out of the house for a one hour meeting. Um, so, you know, there's this online option. I totally appreciate that. I actually, I could have made it down to the GMT headquarters here in the South End. Um, but I just think that that can maybe, you know, give you an example of what the impact is. And the main reason that it was going to take so long was that I had to wait 25 minutes to change from the six to the seven at the downtown transit center, because the six would have gotten me in at 505 and I would have had to wait until 530 for the next bus. That's what the difference of that 20 minute service to 30 minute service. That's the impact it has on you know, what you would hope would be a simple trip. Right. Yes, I, we recognize that, Dale, and we totally understand the frustration um, around moving to 30-minute service. Uh, the next person is Monica. Monica, feel free to move, unmute. Hi, uh, thanks for having this meeting. I, um, I ride the number seven bus uh, to and from downtown. I actually need to get to UVM. Um, and I see your numbers and I see that you have to save money, um, but I see that the afternoon outbound peak hours, like with 30 minute service, you're going to 28 passengers on the bus. And I'm not sure how many, you know, at what point do you cut off and say, uh, we're gonna run more buses because um, pre-pandemic um, for commuter, uh, you ran that bus every 15 minutes, which was nice. And then that got reduced and okay, 20 minutes is better. But it's like, if one of the buses is late or you just barely miss one of the bus, now that it's, you have to wait 30 minutes for the next one. It just doesn't make it very convenient. Um, and then also for the specials buses, you're busing kids to Hunt Middle School. And I, you said you ran a 658. I'm assuming those are times it leaves downtown. 658, 710. You just moved the 740 um, number seven bus in the morning to go at 730. The 740 bus got kids there perfectly right just before 8 a.m. So you have the 658, 710, and 810. None of those are convenient for Hunt kids to get there right before school. The two buses got them way before and the 810 gets them after school starts. And then there was a gentleman, the first online person who asked questions, um, he said he was asking if he can take a special bus. Well, a few years ago, a specials bus would never stop for an adult. They would just wave, you know, wave at you. See you later. You're waiting at a bus stop. So those are some issues I have. I think that there should be a commuter bus for the new North End to UVM Medical Center and UVM. I think there's a lot of people at both those places that live here in the new North End. And I've suggested this to our um, city councilors. I see Mark Barlow's on the call. So that's something that uh, would make um, car usage go down and hopefully ridership on buses go up. So those are some of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, and I will, there, there's a lot of question about the, the neighborhood buses. Um, there still is a bus in the new north end of Burlington that gets punk students to school before eight o'clock. The 650, the 710, and the 810 trips that I was referring to are directly in the North Avenue schedule. Those are North Avenue trips, not uh, 
not neighborhood uh, trippers. Oh, service. okay. Those are number seven buses. Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. That was a sure. misunderstanding. <laughs> but um, but I guess the other question is like the specials buses. It's really hard to figure out when they run. And then even when we get to your website and get the schedule, it doesn't seem like they show up when they're supposed to. Yes, those are, I, I fully recognize those schedules are um, a little bit confusing. And so we do have, we've been talking a lot about those internally um, and how to improve those for the next academic school year. So that is something that we're working on. It is something that we recognize um, there are, not as many defined times in those schedules uh, because of the way that they operate and the way that they travel. Um, but we'll take a look at that and try to make those more clear for the next school year. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next person is Evan. Evan. Thank you. Um, my question has to do also with transfers. I commute every day from Winooski to Shelburne, um, and it didn't sound so bad at first, but in the last month, it's really wrapped havoc on my commute. Um, just whether I'm riding the nine or the two to get there, um, the wait for the six is always it's 25 minutes or it's 30 minutes. Um, and my question is whether anyone's looked at or if there's a way, even with the 30 minute frequency, to at least make transfer times line up better. Yes. The, yeah. I mean, the short answer is yes, we can take a look at the schedules and see what we have um, built in there for layover time mm -hmm. and see if we can better make them. I, mean, I, think, I think the shelter is scheduled to get in as the Pine Street is leaving, I mean, the um, the Riverside, but you could have factored in the shelter to just 10 minutes late, which you could adjust the bus schedule for traffic, by the way. That's a simple thing that you can do. We do certainly look at that. But how does it really actually get there? Yeah. Great. Um, we do have the ability to monitor that. We do have a system where we do monitor that. And we use that system to make adjustments to future schedules. So we look at if we run late and we look at if we run early. Um, and we do use that data to make adjustments to the schedule. Certainly there's a lot happening on Shelburne Road um, right now, which I think is causing some of the delay. Um, and we can take a look at that um, as well. Um, the next person is Lucy. Lucy. Yep, hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm curious when I'm looking at the proposed 30 minute service for number seven, afternoon peak, what, what is the maximum number of people that can fit on the bus? 60. 60. 60, 6 -0. 6 -0, yes. You fit 60 people on those buses? <laughs> yes. Wow, okay. Um, I lived in a place um, when I was in the Peace Corps where, uh, you know, I know it's complicated and I know it's it impacts the budget, but to have to wait a half an hour makes a really big difference versus 15 or 20 minutes on any, any, uh, anybody who's, who's waiting um, in any weather. And I just think that it's, it's going the wrong direction to switch back um, to 30 minute service um, when, it, you know, it, it doesn't, um, if, you know, if it's shorter, somebody could say, oh, I'm gonna get out there and the longest I'll have to wait is, you know, 15 or 20 minutes versus, you know, half hour, if you miss it, you're in big trouble. But I, I do think that I know that money's huge and it's a complicated system you're running, but if you can look into longer range planning around uh, the impact of having smaller vehicles that run more often, I think it could help a lot more people um, get around, get to work and get to places they need to go. And I do have a comment about the fees, but I think it sounds like we're gonna do that a little later. Uh, we were not going to talk about the fees. I'm happy to, if you have a question. Well, I don't have a question. I just think it, it's, it's really a big mistake to go back to charging um, for buses in terms of environmental people, 
being able to jump on the bus, I think has made a huge difference that it's not costing people for folks who are really strapped and there's more and more people who need to be able to get places and to be able to get on the bus with their mask on and not have to pay, I think is huge. And I think it's really important to look at other sources of funding and try to keep this a free service so that we get as many people riding and getting out of their cars or you know, getting um, places, people who don't have cars and not have to, um, to, to worry about the cost of that. I think it, it's, it's huge. I know environmental impact for you know, people riding the bus more is gonna help. And I know you guys have huge budget concerns too, but to be as creative as you can about keeping this a free, free service, I think would be great. Appreciate you um, listening to us tonight. Thank you. And I'll just quickly mention on the fair free piece, uh, there is a proposal in the legislature uh, that the state would provide GMT the funding to continue uh, the fair free service in FY23. Mm -hmm. um, we're a strong supporter of that. Uh, we ask anyone else who's a supporter to reach out to your elected officials at the state level and um, advocate for that funding. Okay. Uh, because not, not only would that allow us to stay fair free if we did receive that funding, uh, like Jamie mentioned, uh, our, our issue right now is not a lack of federal funding, but a lack of local funding. If we get the money for the fares, we could also avoid these service reductions. So that's okay. uh, still very much at play. It's certainly not a slam dunk. It's a legislative process that we can uh, support, but that we can't uh, influence in terms of their, their decision making. Um, so there is still a chance that these service reductions won't have to happen. Um, okay. And for anyone that's willing to reach out to their uh, elected state officials, I think that would be a, a great help. Okay, so now's the moment to do that. Otherwise, if, if that doesn't pass and that funding doesn't pass, when were you thinking of raising fees or putting uh, fee back on? We are looking at July 11th as a, a start that we would start collecting fares again. Okay. All right, so we all need to reach out to our legislators ASAP. And Especially in the Senate, the House has already approved the transportation bill with the, uh, the funding. So reach out to your state senators. Um, that would be a big help, I think, to uh, be able to continue the fare free and hopefully avoid these service reductions. Okay, thank you for telling us that. Thanks a bunch. Appreciate your And I will work. sort of add, as we talk about that process and that timeline, we are proceeding, assuming that we will have to make these service reductions until we hear otherwise about that funding that John's speaking about um, because of our sort of internal process. And so, you know, I appreciate everybody coming and making comments today and hopefully um, we won't have to proceed down this path, but that's that sort of gives you an understanding of why we're here today, why we're still sort of moving forward. We won't hear about that funding likely until um, May. Yeah, GMT is hoping for the best, but we're planning for the worst, and um, you know that's kind of okay. the position we're in right now. If you can get help, get the word out too to encourage people to contact their state senators. I think that would be helpful. I'll definitely spread the word too. Appreciate you know. I think that that's a big deal, knowing that that could make make the difference to keeping the buses free and the service running as it is. Great. Thank you, Lucy, for your comments. You bet. The next person is Marlena. Hi, I'm Marlena Compton, um, and full disclosure, I also work at CATMA, but I am here personally as someone who requires the number six Shelburne bus to get to my job in Winooski. Um, I ride the bus twice a week um, and telework uh, the other days that I work, and these changes would highly impact my ability to be able to get to work and to get home. I am in a one car family that is not gonna be changing. And so this is quite an impact. Um, I also require the six if I want to do any grocery shopping during the week. Um, and even on the weekend, like currently, I'm just completely stranded on Sundays because there is no six down in South Burlington where I live. Um, and I have concerns about like increasing these times. I'm kind of aware of what's going on in the legislature and it, it, looks, it looks awfully like the Senate is gonna block this fair free um, 
money because they're concerned that the public will begin to expect fare free transit, which I personally don't think is bad. I'm not sure exactly. Like, I can't quote anyone on that, but it does look like the fares are going to be brought back unless there is quite a lot of, um, you know, agitation from the public. But in the case that the fares are returned, um, I'm concerned about the impact that this will have even further on uh, slowing down the bus. Because as you know, if you have to take fares, um, it does uh, create a delay in the buses. Um, so that that's my concern. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marlena. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Chris? Next up is Sandy Hanneberger. Uh, hi, um, I will just echo what Lucy and Marlena said. I agree with them totally. And I could add increasing, going back, we need to keep the fares free for so many different reasons. But among the others, I remember an article oh, months ago where they, they figured out that stopping a bus, helping someone with change to use the machines that collect the money, those cost money. So it's actually cost effective to have free, uh, free fares. And I haven't looked at the figures, but that's what it said. And that's something to look into an argument. And I'm so glad that um, I got all the information from the other two women. <laughs> I totally, totally agree with what they've said. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Sandy. We don't disagree with anything you're saying. But we Good. appreciate your comments. Next up is uh, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think one thing I think I just want to say real quick after listening to everybody is it would be it would be great to have no fare when you ride on the bus. But in reality, it's hard to say, yeah, for public transportation is free. Like I'm sure Boston people saying the same thing. New Yorkers saying the same thing. Everywhere people are saying, let's travel, travel for free. I just want to point out that it's it's kind of hard to request that. But my question real actually was a, a couple months ago, the number seven during times where it seemed to be peak rides, they might have had a couple more rides then. Could there potentially be any sort of setup where it would be like 20 minute ride service from maybe seven to nine, and then it can go back to the 30 minute rides from the times that aren't as popular? It may not even be those times exactly, but I realized that the bus can't, fit everyone's schedule perfectly but if it was able to look at the majority of people when they rode and maybe was able to use a 20 minute schedule during those hour or two and then went back to the 30 minutes throughout the rest of the day that might still be able to help the people who are trying to get to work or from work and yet still go towards the new proposal you guys are having right here Thank you, Ben. Yes, we'll, we're, you know, we're exploring all options. I will note with the number seven bus specifically, um, there are periods of time in the morning where we are operating 20 minute service and some 10 minute headway frequencies as well um, with those supplemental trips that we were talking about. Um, and that sort of starts around 6.30 in the morning um, and then around, you know, ends around 8.30. Yeah. Those will be every 20 minutes? They're, they're not every 20 minutes right now. Some are 20 minutes, some are 10 minutes, but they're all part of this number seven schedule. Um, so if you have access to that schedule, um, those trips are in there. We will look at spreading those out more. Yeah, it, we're going to take a look. Um, we put those in there to reduce some of the, the um, capacity concerns in the morning, um, but we'll look at spreading those out and hopefully we can get to um, a 20 minute, uh, leaving every 20 minutes with those supplemental trips. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up is Michael Arnold. Uh, hello, so thanks. Um, I think we all sort of realize the budgetary concerns that um, you're facing, but I, I'm curious why um, why we're 100% relying on uh, sort of the Senate local match instead of you know providing um, 
plans to you know local officials, many of whom have publicly stated support for increasing transit options, and you know asking like the city of Burlington and the city of South Burlington to increase their local match to provide more service, since these are you know our local representatives who are most uh, you know engaged and concerned with our issues here. Um, you know, over the past couple months, you know, with like the Winooski um, at bike lane, you know, maybe four or five city councilors have publicly stated that they want increased um, service on that Winooski at quarter, um, which, you know, the, the seven serves. Um, so when we have all these public officials and members of the public saying we want increased transit service, um, why hasn't GMT created a plan to, you know, offer that service, you know, even if the public has to pay some increased cost. Thanks. So that, that's a great question. We have done um, some recent outreach uh, to our municipal partners. Uh, when we go through our, our budget uh, process, um, our board and GMT staff is certainly sensitive that uh, our member municipalities pay using uh, property tax dollars, which are uh, overburden as it is. Um, so in FY23, uh, we do, uh, we will collect a 4% increase uh, across the board from our member municipalities. Uh, we do collect about $3 million annually from our local, local communities, uh, including about 1.6 million from the city of Burlington. So um, the problem is that our costs uh, with fuel uh, wages and insurance alone are really outpacing that 4% uh, increase that uh, we've uh, been approved by our board to assess. Um, if there's additional opportunity to collect more uh, local money, we will explore that, but uh, it is difficult for uh, communities to uh, come up with that based on the over-reliance on the property tax. Uh, the other piece that's challenging right now is our uh, ADA program. Uh, similar to our fixed route services, their costs are increasing as well with fuel, especially. Um, so the assessment increases to our local communities have been uh, much higher uh, than they historically have been. So we're trying to balance a, a few different things budgetarily, uh, which certainly complicates the uh, total equation. But we are having ongoing conversations, uh, not only with municipalities, but with some of our institutional partners. Uh, trying to find a non-federal match anywhere that we possibly can. Thanks. I'd, I'd just like to point out that other municipalities, you know, like, you know, who are relatively comparable, like Ithaca, New York, uh, fund their transit systems at over four times per capita the rate that Burlington uh, contributes to GMT and, you know, have a considerably higher ridership per capita um, while running less buses just because they run them more frequently. Um, so I, I think that if you could make some explicit um, service alternatives and present them to public officials who are actually elected representatives um, and allow them to make that, uh, you know, to choose between whether to cut service or to increase, um, you know, increase the increase service or keep it at the same levels, that would be a much better process than, you know, having this done by you know, uh, appointees who, who aren't elected. Thanks. Next up is Sarah. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, so yeah, I mean, I am a person who does rely on the bus to get around along with many of my friends and um, I don't have that much to say, but I did just want to voice my opposition for cuts to the bus routes because, you know, if buses are underutilized, then the only way to expand them is to increase stops, not cut them. And by cutting them, as many people have voiced, people's jobs can be at pretty high risk. Um, only having stops every 30 minutes can definitely be the difference between being on time and seriously late to work. And I just, Feel that people who can't afford to uh, depend on cars in our car dependent society need life to be more convenient and not less so at the expense of convenience for cars. And also just so much research has proven that making bus routes fare free increases ridership and um, timeliness of buses. So I think that the choice is pretty clear. Um, and I really hope that 
everyone will consider. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next up is Representative McCormick. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for having this hearing. And it's a, it's a very, very friendly hearing. And I want to um, add my voice to the support of uh, a fair free and also um, of restoring the uh, service that has been uh, cut. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, um, increasing ridership, those are two things that are going to be contrary to that, as, as you know. Um, a little bit of the politics going on now. Um, when the bill, the big bill, we call it the T bill, it stands for the transportation program bill. It's, it's the budget for transportation. It's pushing a billion dollars now. And um, we put uh, 1.4 million in for fare free. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, at the end, uh, when the bill was still in the house and my committee, I'm on the transportation committee, and when the bill was still here, um, there was a move to take that out. So we, we had the compromise. And as, as you folks have probably heard from GMT, that um, we kept fare free in there for GMT, except for the link service. Um, that wound up only costing us $167 less that we're going to get. And, um, you know, the link service is different. It's the much longer rides I ride it. I wrote it. Um, yesterday down here to Montpelier. Um, so the fares would come back on the link, but not the rest of GMT. And um, uh, as far as who to lobby, I think we wanna ask people to also contact their house members also, because as this bill comes back, I don't know what shape it's going to be in. There will be a conference committee and you're right. It'll be, if not May, um, I think we're gonna be out by the first week of May. So. By the last week in April this month, um, we should know how, how at least how we're doing on, on the fare free. And then on the um, on the service cuts, um, which you know we didn't know about when we had the bill in the House, but the Senate knows, and we do have senators working hard to try to restore that. Uh, but they really do need to hear from folks. Um, Senator Tom Chittenden is a member of the Transportation Committee, and he's um, in, the, in the Senate and he represents Chittenden County. So um, he's already with the program, but it wouldn't hurt for him to hear from people and the other senators as well, all six of our, our senators and your representative. Uh, I, I represent the Old North End and downtown. Um, the more that people hear from, from folks back home on this, um, the better. So, um, uh, again, I just wanna thank you. Oh, and somebody brought up the local contribution um, I, I, I want to disagree with that. I think what we want to move to on the local distribution is the state picking that up as well. And I think that's been something that some of your board members have talked to me about. Um, and um, I think that makes sense. The property tax is it's just the worst tax in the world. And that's where the money comes from with, with, for the local contributions. And I know that, that and I know the board knows this, that um, some some towns have a hard time raising that money. So the state should pick that up too. I don't think we could do that this year. This year, it's gonna be fair free to fight for and money to restore the cut service services. But next year, let's work on the state taking taking up what, what is now the local share. And for, thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is David. Hi. Um, so my name is David. Um, I'm a senior at UVM and a Burlington resident. Um, I really appreciate GMT offering space tonight um, for public comment on this really concerning proposal and also for their tremendous service to our community. Um, so I'm calling in because as someone who regularly rides GMT to get groceries and commute across town, I'm really deeply concerned about these proposed busing cuts and especially the possibility of bus fares being reinstated. Um, you know, despite its notable successes, you know, Vermont has been pretty impotent in terms of responding to the climate crisis by transitioning away from, you know, this dominant 
um, car centric model of transportation. Um, and then further, you know, in light of the COVID pandemic and ongoing austerity measures, working class Vermonters more than ever need accessible and convenient transportation options to get to their jobs and provide for their needs. Um, Vermont's poor and working class communities have suffered enough from the commodification of basic interstate transportation. And now is the time to go on the offensive, not the defensive, in terms of creating a flourishing, sustainable, public transportation system to replace widespread car usage. Um, our change in climate doesn't afford us time to stall. So I strongly urge GMT to reject this proposal and take whatever steps necessary to ensure fair free and accessible public transportation in our community. Okay, that's all. Um, thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you, David. I'm just going to quickly pause on the Zoom. We do have a, a bus coming. Um, to our facility in a few minutes. I just want to recognize anybody in the room who might have anything else to say. Yeah, any other comments? Okay, I just wanted to be sensitive of your time and not make you late for the, the 640. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next up is Jean Hopkins. Yes, I've been relying on the bus ever since I had to give up my car about four or five years ago. And here's my ticket. And I really don't mind paying some for fare, but when you change the uh, shuttle bus from every 15 minutes to every 45 minutes, that made my life really more complicated. And I hope that you can return to at least every half hour for the shuttle bus. Um, but I do use the Shelburne Road bus occasionally and the North Ave bus. Um, when the weather's better, I can get out more easily. I'm a senior citizen. And so I, I am relying on the buses. And I really thought the bus system was wonderful. I live on East Ave and there used to be a bus along East Ave, but I guess they took it off because of the traffic. And so I climb up to the hospital and get the shuttle bus. And that's very helpful for me. So I hope that's, I hope you can improve that. Um, but changing from, you know, 20 minutes to 30 minutes is a big deal. And I, I hope you don't lessen the bus trips anymore. Thank you. And I don't mind paying a little now that I'm a senior, that discount was very good. I even bought a, a ticket before you um, said they weren't needed anymore. And I don't know if I should hold on to it. <laughs> Thank you. I would hold on to it for now, but hopefully you won't need it. So it will still be good after two or three years? <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Next up is Richard Watts. Hi, Richard. Everybody, I don't know if you can see me. Um, thank you for the um, providing the service and I hope we can keep it going. I ride the bus every day. I live in Heinsburg and um, when I come into town, it's really great to have these loops that are exist in town. And as you all know, I will do anything I can to encourage more people to take advantage of this wonderful option. I'm one of those people who, oh, have given up a car and so really rely on the bus and then I can use my bike sometimes in between and. I have a lot of advantages of my schedule, but still, I just really believe in what you're doing. And I like Kurt's suggestion, and I am going to do that, email all those folks and try and chime in here. So please, if we can, figure out a way to get <coughs> going. Thank you, Richard. That was everyone in line currently. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna move forward in the presentation. I just have a couple more slides um, as it relates to the Montpelier Link Express service. Um, we did, again, in on March 7th, we did reduce link service by four runs um, and we are proposing to continue that. However, uh, we recognize that the current schedule doesn't meet everybody's needs. So we have been uh, conducting a public comment survey um, for folks. To date, we've had 143 passengers take that survey. And the data that we're collecting is, uh, you know, folks' ideal 
start and end times when they want to uh, be leave their their origin when they want to get to their destination um, in the morning and in the afternoon. And so we are right in the middle of looking at all of that data. Um, and I hope that we'll have a schedule to post tomorrow for that. Um, and again, we'll be at the Montpelier Transit Center um, from 3 to 6 p.m. tomorrow uh, to discuss the Montpelier link uh, with folks. Uh, we have two folks in line, I think, for the Montpelier link. First up was Graham. Graham. Hello, um, my name's Graham Sheriff. Uh, I work at UVM and I live in Montpelier. Um, normally, I would take the 86 Link Express um, three or four times a week. Um, I, I appreciate, like everybody else, the opportunity to share some input here. Um, I'm also disappointed, though, that the cuts were made to the Link Express and, and to other routes um, before having any consultation with riders. Um, I'm also um, disappointed by the lack of meaningful notification. I learned that my bus was cancelled when it when I was sat in the park and ride at the Montpelier Department of Labor and the bus never came. Um, and as I've talked with other riders on the 86 link, um, it's kind of laughable how many other people have had exactly the same experience. I think if GMT makes changes to schedules, I think you need to make um, a much more earnest effort to communicate changes in advance. Um, regarding the changes that I can, I'm concerned about, I'm, as I say, I would normally take the link three or four times a week. I'm not actually a GMT rider at the moment because my bus has been cut. I can't take the link. So um, I'm, I appreciate that the, time, the, the specific timings for link services are going to be reconsidered with this additional data that's going to be gathered. Um, my particular concern is that the 752 northbound from Montpelier to Burlington was cut because that's the only bus that I can take after dropping off my kids at school. Um, so my household is one where I cannot just switch to an earlier service. And when I've, um, been in communication um, with GMT about why that particular service was cut, given based on, I haven't seen any load analysis, but based on my own observations, um, it seems to me like there are a good many more riders on the 752 than say the 555. Um, when I've inquired why that particular service was chosen for discontinuation, I've been told that um, that was due to staffing issues in Burlington. And that seems like, a short-term issue and um, one where the finances should be in place within the budget to resolve. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm still very unclear on why, on how that selection was made. Um, we've been talking about fares. Um, for me, the question of fares is moot because the, there's no service that I can take. So for my two cents is that um, the services need to be in place um, before um, giving consideration to um, you know, what, what happens with fares. Um, if you cut services, um, GMT's locked into a, a smaller slate of, of services, and I don't see how you grow ridership. I don't see how you grow um, the budget that way. So. Um, uh, I, I look forward to seeing what schedule um, emerges from the, the data for the Montpelier link. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. Next up is Dale. Thank you. So um, I commuted on the link from Burlington to Montpelier five days a week for around five years leading up to the start of the pandemic in March 2020. And I will say, actually, when um, when the pandemic started and uh, like a lot of other people, I switched to working at home. I really missed that daily ride because it was a pleasure um, and I still miss it. And um, I started going back to my office uh, about two, three weeks ago and was dismayed to find out not just that um, several routes had been cut, 
but also that um, all but one of the routes in the morning detours off the interstate to go through Waterbury. So you didn't just cut the Burlington Montpelier routes, you also cut the Burlington Waterbury routes so that now people who are going to Montpelier have to go through Waterbury. It adds about 10, 15 minutes onto the ride. It also makes the ride um, you know, a lot more stop and go, a lot less comfortable and relaxing. And, and you know, it's going to be hard um, if there's only, you know, if that's the only choice, it's going to be hard to go back to commuting by bus five days a week um, when I've got a car sitting in my driveway. Um, so if you want to be serving that mission of getting people out of cars and reducing traffic on the road, reducing parking stress in Montpelier, reducing greenhouse gases, um, the service quality needs to be there. The quantity, the number of choices for, for people like the previous speaker and myself, and also um, the quality. So I filled out the survey, but there wasn't anywhere to say that a bus that goes through Waterbury is not as good as a bus that goes, you know, straight Burlington, Richmond, Montpelier. Um, that wasn't a choice, and um, I wish it had been. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Jenny. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for having this meeting and letting us all um, speak to these issues. I ride the Montpelier Link Express. Before the pandemic, I used to ride probably three to even five days a week. Um, and um, I know that ridership is down on that route when I've taken it now. Certainly there's nowhere near as many people as there used to be. However, um, I was dismayed that both the morning bus and the evening bus I used to take were eliminated. Um, I work for the state at the National Life Building. And as you may know, um, many state workers work from 7.45 to 4.30. Um, the bus that used to leave in the morning from Burlington at 6.45 is currently gone, which means um, a choice of either trying to get a super early bus to get there terribly early that goes through Waterbury or getting there after eight o'clock, which technically makes me late. Um, and then the evening route going home, I used to take the 445, that currently also was eliminated. If I get off at 430, currently I have to wait until 520 for a bus. That's almost an hour after I get off and after a long day, that's just horrible. <laughs> um, and I know you said you're, you're considering, um, you know, doing different things with the time and everything, but I just wanted to say, I, I'm sure you're aware there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of state workers in Montpelier and so many of them work that 745 to 430 schedule. And depending on their office, they may not have the ability to change their hours. Um, so looking at the times of when people are starting um, and finishing would be just excellent. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. That's it for folks in line. Okay. Um, so just a really brief public hearing timeline. So uh, we're on the second step right now, um, conducting these meetings. Um, once again, we have another tomorrow from three to 6 p.m. Um, and then next steps from there is gathering all of our public feedback and creating a report for our GMT Board of Commissioners um, to see, to consider, um, and to vote on April 19th, um, either for or against implementing service changes. Um, and then those service changes would go into effect um, in June. That's, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see people. Um, so that, that's where we are in terms of timeline right now. Um, I'm happy to answer any additional questions or if anybody else has anything they'd like to add um, for public feedback, um, we're, we're happy to hear from, from any and all of you. 
Matthew has raised his hand. Matthew? Greetings. Uh, yes, GMT um, uh, councilmen and women. Yes, I have a concern about, about the accessibility part of it. It's just feedback and knowing I live in the most rural part of the you know state of in Grand Isle County of Auburn, Vermont, and everybody knows that. That rural parts of uh, of Vermont, you know, need more busing services. And uh, just, you know, for the accessibility standpoint is limited, limiting these options basically underfunds the ADA, American with Disability Act, you know, objectives if you do that, as you know, it's federally, federally mandated to actually uphold these rules and laws. I understand companies have their own, you know, way of looking at things. Are we really serving true justice to people that actually need accessible, more affordable transportation options, especially in rural parts of the state of Vermont, where, as you may see, as you know, transportation for a percent of you know citizens that need this these services, like people with disabilities, senior citizens, and veterans, where you know, in some limited ca capacity, actually need these services. Is there ways that we could move forward? knowing that uh, the system we have was not built for everyone. How can we achieve these goals and achieve where we want to go forward, move forward with Vermont, with the transportation sector? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, it, it appears that uh, nobody else has any comments um, and GMT doesn't have any more presentations. So we're happy to, to hear more, um, I'm happy to put my email in the chat. Um, and if anybody has any public comment uh, that they'd like to provide uh, between now and early next week, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, and if anything comes up, any questions come up for you, um, please feel free to reach out to, to me and I'm happy to, um, to answer those questions for you. And thank you all for joining us. This this was a really great turnout. We're happy to see all of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.